Welcome to the South African Civil Society Information Service. I'm Fazila Farouk in Johannesburg. Since the Marikana massacre, the issue of inequality in South Africa has really been exposed and is very much being discussed in the mainstream of discussions, uh, many discussions taking place in the media as well. There have been many appeals by people, including public figures, um, to address the crisis of poverty and inequality in South Africa. So here at SACSIS, what we've decided to do is to look at some of the systemic problems that are driving the problems in our society. And one of the issues that we are looking at is the financialization of the South African economy. And with us today in the studio, we have Siraj Mohammed. Siraj is Director of Corporate Strategy and Industrial Development at the School of Economic and Business Sciences at Wits University. Siraj has done quite a lot of research on the financialization of the South African economy. Welcome back to Saxis. Thank you. Now, Siraj, tell us what you mean by this. Can you unpack what it means when you say there's a high level of financialization in the South African economy? What does that mean? Well, financialization broadly is defined as the increasing role and influence of finance over domestic and in the international economy. And what we've seen since the late 70s, early 80s, you can think about it, I suppose, with the rise of people like Thatcher and Reagan and the drive towards more free, uh, free market style capitalist systems, there's been increasing deregulation of the financial systems within countries, but also a push for countries to liberalize access to fin financial institutions from other countries, but also capital flows across borders. And so you've had removal of exchange controls and capital controls. You've had um, removal of uh, rules about which banks can invest in which countries, where they, but also within countries. In the US, the Glass-Steagall Act is often used as the example where you had this creation of universal banking. You didn't have a separation across what different parts of the financial institutions were allowed to do. Also, right up to, I forget the dates, the 70s, certain banks could only operate within certain states in the US. They couldn't operate across the US. And, and these controls were put in place with the realization that the f financial system can actually be harmful to economies. Um, and, and from the 70s, when the US sort of unilaterally caused the breakdown of the Bretton Woods arrangements, but there was increasing deregulation of banks and other financial institutions and, and cross-border flows, you had the ability of finance to grow. And, and the, with that, also, most governments didn't put in place adequate regulation of new financial instruments and new financial institutions, like hedge funds, private equity funds, and those things. And so, through that process, what we've seen is that in many countries, and in some countries like Britain from the 80s, consciously a decision that they were going to be try and become the, a global financial center again and, and retake their position that they had leading up to the First World War and the Great Depression, where Britain was the major financial power in the world. And that was replaced by the US after the First World War. And so Britain wanted to take back that position, so the focus became the city of London, and they allowed manufacturing and industry to go into decline. And with that, we saw less focus on social services, on education, on training, and actually declines in that, and in growing inequality in countries like Britain. Um, and today, Britain's really suffering from, from the, the last uh, or continuing global financial crisis that we're in. But it's, those processes have happened across the world. But talk about it in relation to South Africa. How has that developed in our country? Well, in South Africa, the, the, the apartheid government, um, I think, started a process of liberalizing um, the financial institutions. And they were basically, I think, to, to get, one is they were struggling for international flows into the economy. They were being isolated. But two is to increase their credibility, political credibility, 
they actually saw adopting the kind of neoliberal policies, the Washington consensus policies that were being pushed by Britain and the US as part of that process. And in, in doing that, they liberalized the financial institutions, they tried to remove exchange controls. In 85, we had the huge debt crisis, the debt standstill, um, and we had to reschedule debt, and they actually went back to some certain kind of exchange controls. And so there was this process, and we've seen a continuity of policies from apartheid through the, with the ANC government, and, and um, with Trevor Manuel as Minister of Finance, towards uh, liberalization and following and emulating the kinds of policies that Britain and the US had. Um, now, what, what, by the 1990s, there was a huge amount of change globally linked to um, global financialization at the time when we were coming out of apartheid. And, and we hadn't put in place policies which um, countries, especially the East Asian countries, but other countries had put in place to protect themselves from this craziness that was developing in the global financial system. And so on top of an unequal society and an economic structure based on what we call minerals and energy complex and that developing, we had a process of financialization of the economy and with the large mining and financial companies then looking towards this process of global financialization and the global corporate restructuring that went with it and saying we want to be part of that game. And so they essentially took a huge amount of capital, money that they had developed with, you know, through super exploitation in the mining industry and other parts of society and wealth that had been created through exploiting resources and people. They used that to become major players and a huge amount of that money left. We saw the offshore listings of Anglo-American, Old Mutual, many investing large financial institutions and large corporations. And so these corporations, as they became global players, became very much under the influence of the shareholder value movement and institutional investors of the North. And so they became institu institutionalized in their own right. But the South African economy, um, uh, we saw a as this kind of movement of capital out of the country occurred with the offshore listings, the South African economy became much more dependent on mining again but we saw a huge growth in the financial sector. And, and the industrial structure, or the weak industrial structure we had actually has become worse. So financialization has exacerbated the problems of the minerals and energy complex. Um, and the major players that had benefited from you know, the growth of the minerals and energy complex and the, apart the apartheid state support of mining and finance have now become global players, they become internationalized, and they're not really interested in South Africa employment creation and industrial diversification and building the South African economy. I mean, one of the large sources of South African wealth has always been mining. And, and gov I don't think government has made enough effort to extract the royalties and rents from the mining industry and then to use that in a developmental way to support dealing with the uh, industrial diversity and building the industrial base, but also investing in the future of the South African economy so that when once we've extracted those resources, those non-renewable mineral resources that we have, we're not left with empty holes, but we're actually left with investments within the economy that supports the well-being and, 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 and growth, not only of the current generation, but future generations. So it's not only all South Africans now which are important, but also future generations of South Africa, because the, there are huge costs, environmental and other costs, to, to mining. And so what other countries like Norway and, and I mean, uh, what we're seeing in, for instance, the Middle East is that they using these sovereign wealth funds and they, they're using the taxes on the minerals and oil that's being extracted to, to develop these funds. One is part of what they do with the funds is to try and remove what they call this um, Dutch disease uh, where you to stop your exchange rate from going up too much linked to the fact that you're exporting so much minerals. But two is they're actually looking for strategic investments within their own economies that are going to be in the interest of development and, and they're seeing it as 
nat and national resources and national legacies that they're building, not only focus on small groups of people. And I think part of our problem in South Africa is that we saw the, the, the kind of political um, compromise that was made was that you know, large corporations like Anglo-American would be allowed to, to move offshore. They'd be allowed to take a lot of that wealth out of the country. They, that was seen as, you know, what they had done in the past was their ingenuity and them becoming wealthy based on that, not based on exploitation of our resources and people. Um, and, and I think that kind of thinking about mining still continues. And we also see mining in light of having to attract foreign investment and maintaining credibility in global financial markets and, and with credit ratings agencies. We don't see mining as a place, as something that, you know, where we, that we use for long-term development. Um, and, and so I think there needs to be a huge mindset. I think the other problem was that the way in which people thought about equality and, and uh, the mining industry became a big part of this was through BE. And um, so if you gave part of the ownership of the mining industry to black people, then you were seen to be remedying the problem. But in fact, that made it worse. You actually then had a growing inequality and, and also possibilities for corruption and other things linked to that. Rather than seeing, thinking through how you use the wealth created in the mining industry and then spread that through the society and see, uh, invested it in, in the country. Um, and, and I think there's, there's a very clear link between sort of the fact that we've financialized but at the same time become more dependent on our mining industry and, and, and um, the, the kinds of socioeconomic problems we're seeing in the country as well. And so while we, I mean, if you look at the boards of the, the mine, we're, we're having wildcat strikes in the mining industry now, they are black faces, they're black owners, but that hasn't solved any of the problems. I mean, I think we need to think about these things at a much more um, national level and a strategic level in terms of policy and industrial and other kinds of development of the South African economy. So tell me, what scope for any transformative agenda in South Africa? You mentioned that there was a split in gov government, some competing forces. Can you talk about that? I think I mean, what we're seeing coming out of um, places like the Department of Trade and Industry and the Economic Development Department is a call for thinking about finance and maybe reforming the financial sector towards supporting um, socioeconomic policies, but also policy, industrial policies and others. Um, and we, I think what we've seen is a resistance to that from uh, the uh, National Treasury, the Reserve Bank and, and other parts of government. So I th and I mean, if you think about, for instance, just the discussion about managing the, the exchange rates, you know, different ministers have come out publicly with opposing views on, on, on this matter. Um, and, and I mean, the governor of the Reserve Bank and the Minister of Finance have said, you know, it's not about managing the exchange rate, it's about making industry more productive. But I mean, that sort of shows an ignorance of the whole history of the South African economy, how, the, how it's, we become industrialized and the role of finance and financi financialization of the economy is that our productivity is severely limited by the way in which the economy is developed. And, and the role of finance and macroeconomic policy further constrains the productivity and the ability to uh, or actually where capital is allocated, where the people are being employed, where investment happens. And this, this isn't only South Africa. Economies like if you compare different European economies, for instance, if you compare France and Germany, Germany has become less financialized than France, and the levels of investment and accumulation in Germany have been higher than France. Um, and it's true if you, uh, uh, across the world. I mean, look, if you look at East Asia versus the, the West, the, these, these elements are true as well. But it's also true in, if you compare the post-Second World War period with the neoliberal era. Where, where you had less financialization and you had different kinds of macro policies. The macro policy agenda of most countries after the Second World War was to support full employment and uh, rebuilding and industrialization of economies. During the 
neoliberal era, macro policy became focused on fighting inflation and keeping government deficits low, which was supportive of finance and the growth of finance. And the global GDP, but also GDP across different countries, was much higher during that post-Second World War period than the neoliberal era. I mean, these, these are numbers that you, so you can find in sort of World Bank working papers and, and other things. And so we, we've got the historical record and we've also got sort of comparing countries in the current period, which shows the impact of financialization on the productive sector, on training, on, on employment, on how much is put into education and skills and how skills are valued. And, and we've seen in countries that have become financialized, higher levels of inequality as well. So, I mean, for me, the answer is actually thinking through how you reform your financial system and how you regulate finance and government taking charge of allocation of capital, moving it away from, one is consumption by the affluent <laughs> and, and two is speculation in financial markets towards actually directing money towards productive activities that are going to create the kinds of jobs, but also social investments and infrastructure that we require. And what's happened with financialization, that money, a lot of money moves out of the country to speculate in global financial markets, or it causes bubbles in our own financial markets or in our real estate markets. Okay. Mohamed, thank you very, very much for joining us. And thank you for joining us at the South African Civil Society Information Service. Thank you.